Rokuto was a scrawny, geeky unpopular loser who ended up in a school run he delinquents, making it seem impossible for him and his friends to survive the constant bullying. However he got a crazy gift from his grandpa's ghost which he thought would make him the next demon slayer, but it made him a chick magnet for badass girls instead. How did he find himself in such a mess? On a regular school afternoon, Rokuto found himself dragged into playing food toss by a bunch of troublemakers with the aim of a Call of Duty bot. They hurled his lunch at him, making him try to catch it with his mouth, all while laughing at his failed attempts. Their leader, Inuma, lobbed one last sausage his way, which Rokuto missed, earning one final round of mockery before he could escape to his fellow dorky fellows, Colonel and Chief. After getting literally dunked on by delinquents, the trio escaped to their secret HQ, the toilet, to vent their frustrations and trash talk the bullies in the only place where they could win. Later at Rokuto's place, a surprise delivery arrived from his late grandfather. Curiosity flew. He cracked open the box to find a letter and a scroll inside. The letter revealed that the scroll held powers to aid in times of peril, a family treasure dating back to the Heian period. Bro got Master Ugwe's scroll. Recalling his grandfather's kindness, Rokuto suspected there might be something to it and decided to give it a try. As he grasped the scroll, a mysterious light glowed, leaving a star-shaped mark on his forehead. If this doesn't make him uglier, I don't know what does. The next day, as Rokuto made his way to school, the usual gang of delinquents kicked his butt for money. But this time, one of them, a chick from the group, intervened, calling off the harassment. This unexpected act caught Rokuto off guard. Later, in class, when Inuma tried to bully him, another gang member, Tsubaki, intervened, asking him to bully Rokuto's friends instead. Guess they're really not as important. In their top secret HQ, Rokuto told his friends about the strange occurrences surrounding him. Suddenly, Tsubaki entered, offering Rokuto a sincere apology for the daily bullying. This odd turn of events signaled that something was definitely not right. No shit Sherlock. Further complications arose when Inuma aggressively confronted Rokuto, demanding to know what he had done to Tsubaki, who was quick to make Rokuto her phone wallpaper. Rokuto realized that the scroll his grandfather left him had the power to attract baddies, leading to a series of increasingly bizarre encounters. In a desperate bid to escape the chaos, Rokuto collided with a particularly menacing girl named Himawari Rana who also became instantly drawn to his inherent riz. Despite his efforts to distance himself, Rana ended up in his class, where a confrontation led to a bully who tried to mess with Rokuto, waking up in the hospital with no memory of what had occurred. Bro scored himself a chick and a bodyguard. Haunted by the ordeal, Rokuto initially flinched back from Rana, fearing her monstrous nature. However, with the encouragement of his friends, he eventually recognized his mistake and resolved to see her as a person. When Rana appeared once more, Rokuto pledged to protect her at all costs, urging her to refrain from fighting and made her promise she wouldn't kick butt again, basically showing her the Uno reverse card. Their resolve was tested when Inuma confronted Rokuto, questioning why all the baddies seemed to gravitate towards him. Bro wanted to learn the generational secret of Riz Jutsu. Rokuto sought Rana's assistance, only to discover her battered and bruised from keeping her promise and not defending herself against attackers. Moved by her dedication to their agreement, Rokuto decided to confront Inuma himself, challenging him to a showdown on the school's rooftop. On the rooftop, Rokuto squared up to Inuma for a brawl, insisting that Rana stay out of their mess. When Rokuto swung first, he managed to land a surprise punch right on target, his first ever successful hit. Such a pitiful achievement. Inuma, caught off guard by the unexpected counterattack, was seriously ticked off. But Inuma hit back hard in a flash and hit him a couple more times with the speed of the flash. It dawned on Rokuto that picking a fight with Inuma might not have been his brightest idea. His buddies felt too chicken to jump in, realizing they were at the bottom of the food chain. But Rokuto had had enough and finally found the guts to tell Inuma to zip it. Just as Inuma was about to lay another smackdown, he froze in fear at the sight of Rana, tipped off by Rokuto's pals. Sure, Inuma respected Rana, but he still hated wimps like Rokuto. Despite Rana promising not to throw down, Inuma kept swinging, getting her more riled up. Despite taking a beating from Inuma, Rokuto stayed on his feet although barely. He was dead set on defending Rana's honor. When he hit his breaking point, he finally mustered the courage to ask for backup. That's when Rana busted into action, decking Inuma with Saitama's one punch. As the rain poured down, Rokuto bid farewell to his pals in a downbeat tone after the royal thrashing he'd just received. Meanwhile, Inuma got taken to the hospital, kind of impressed by Rokuto's never-say-die attitude, realizing maybe he wasn't as feeble as he seemed. 
walking home. Rokuto broke down emotionally, unable to believe he'd cried for a girl to bail him out. Sokka left the chat. The next day, Rokuto's buddies tried lifting his spirits, giving him props for standing up to someone as tough as Inuma. But any cheerfulness was short-lived when the class rep handed him some printouts, a godsend in a school full of troublemakers. But Rokuto quickly sank back into feeling like a loser, unable to bear the thought of being such a pushover. Bro was only being honest with himself. As he shuffled off, his pals gave him some space to sort out his feelings, while also trying to stalk him being as subtle as the angry birds on a covert mission. When the class rep spotted Rokuto surrounded by baddies, she was shocked, while he just yearned for some peace and not some plot. Outside the school gates, Inuma called Rokuto over to a ramen joint. Arriving at the ramen joint, Rokuto witnessed a bunch of middle schoolers treating Inuma like their big boss. He recognized one of them as the guy who'd given him a beatdown before. The guy freaked out at the sight of Rokuto, but Rokuto saved face by acting like he didn't know him, although very embarrassed that he got bullied by middle schoolers. Inuma invited the gang to join them, and they all had a blast. Meanwhile, Colonel and Chief worried their bud might be in over his head. As Rokuto and Inuma left the joint, Rokuto wondered if there was something Inuma wanted to talk about. But Inuma just brushed it off, saying he fancied grabbing a bite with his bud. However, Inuma dropped some unexpected news, revealing that Asanada, the top dog at their school, was gunning for him. As Inuma split, Sasaki, a henchman for Asanada, snagged him. Sasaki demanded to see Rokuto on behalf of his boss, leaving Rokuto trembling. But Sasaki was thrown for a loop, seeing Rokuto as the last guy to have multiple girls wrapped around his finger. He figured he'd nab the wrong dude. But Rokuto's charm won out, and Sasaki's girlfriend jumped to his defense, confirming they had the right guy. When Inuma stepped up, surprising Sasaki, who asked if he'd stand up for Rokuto, Inuma said it was up to Rokuto whether he'd face Asanada head-on or bolt like a scaredy cat. If Rokuto chose to fight, Inuma had his back. Rokuto's buddies popped out of hiding, pleading with him not to do anything stupid. They suggested avoiding the fight altogether and transferring schools, but Rokuto insisted he hadn't done anything wrong and refused to bolt. He talked about how he was supposed to hate delinquents, but he'd actually had a blast with them. He'd already done enough running and hiding. It was time to take a stand. His pals were moved and decided to back him up, strutting into school with their heads held high, wielding the burning passion of Mike Guy and Rock Lee. But Rokuto wasn't alone in this fight. Rana crashed through the wall like Cool Aid Man, Thrilled to see her main man Rokuto, Sasaki was steamed at the interruption, but Rokuto came to Rana's defense, swearing he'd never be as lame as he was on the rooftop. How could he possibly be lamer than that? Rana noted she could flatten Sasaki in a heartbeat, but Rokuto still wanted to keep her safe, and she dug that about him. The whole gang rallied around Rokuto, shielding him. If Asanada wanted to chat with Rokuto, she wouldn't have to look far. Sasaki huffed that Asanada would mop the floor with him, but Rokuto stood firm. Just then, Inuma dropped some surprising news. Asanada was actually a girl. The next day, as the class rep tried to give a report, nobody paid attention. Suddenly, a pint-sized girl with pink hair strolled in. The class rep tried to step in, but got shut down with a sharp jab about her caterpillar brows. Red from Angry Birds won't be happy with that. The pink-haired girl closed in on Rokuto, sending Inuma into a frenzy and it was Asanada, the school's top troublemaker, despite looking like she still sucked her thumb all the time. Inuma threatened all-out war if Asanada wanted to throw down with Rokuto. Rokuto's spell kicked in, leaving Asanada baffled as if she just spawned in the middle of a boss fight. Despite the spell, she leaned in and warned Rokuto he was toast. The gang was surprised that the spell hadn't worked as planned, but it looked like a throwdown or a beatdown was on the horizon. But then Asanada pumped the brakes, sensing something wasn't right. She figured Rana might be trouble and correctly guessed she was Rokuto's girlfriend. Asanada made her disgust for love known, prompting Rokuto to guess her lack of experience and young age were why the spell had backfired. The tension was thick as Asanada riled up Rana, but Rokuto stepped in, urging them to talk it out. But Asanada was impatient and geared up to smack Rokuto. To her shock, her punch lacked life, and she couldn't figure out why. She called in Colonel, who got launched into the wall like a medieval battering ram with one hit. They realized the spell had worked after all. Asanada pondered, baffled by her inability to change Rokuto's facial features with a punch. She even admitted he didn't seem like such a bad dude after all and agreed to chat it out. Grabbing Rokuto's hand, they slipped out of the classroom and tiptoed into the old building. 
To Rokuto's surprise, they stumbled into a room that screamed girly, which turned out to be Asanada's crib. She assured him he was always welcome, despite her recent unwelcoming antics. In fact, she even complimented him, calling him cute. Although Rokuto felt relieved that he wasn't going to get clobbered, he couldn't shake the guilt of messing with people's feelings unintentionally. Meanwhile, Asanada found herself tangled in a web of strange emotions she'd never experienced before. Before they knew it, Rokuto had already become her first love. It brought back memories of Rokuto's own first love, back when a girl had swooped in to rescue him from getting a good butt whooping. That one encounter with Miyu had stuck with him, haunting him wherever he went. First love leaves a scar that never fades, as she got a boyfriend, and Rokuto starts to see her as a delinquent and what in the black face is that? He wasn't thrilled about becoming Asanada's first love, but it was too late, she was already a bundle of nerves and short breaths around him. Since the spell only worked on bad girls, Rokuto set his sights on transforming Asanada, the school's head honcho, into a goody two-shoes. As Rokuto geared up to head back to class, he found Asanada eager to tag along. Despite being two years his senior, she'd flunked the first grade twice and ended up in his class. She was really dead set on showing up every day just to catch a glimpse of Rokuto's infinite riz. This gave Rokuto a chance to try and straighten out Asanada and maybe make school a bit more enjoyable for her. The next day in class, Rokuto raised the idea of sprucing up the school garden and taking care of the plants. Initially, it didn't exactly set the room on fire, but Asanada stepped up, ready to shut down anyone who dissed the idea. Rokuto stepped in to calm her down, ultimately winning the vote to greenlight the project. The whole class got jazzed about the garden gig, which kinda threw the class rep off her game. For weeks, everything ran smooth as silk. Everyone took charge of their plants and kept tabs on their progress with weekly reports. It seemed like the whole class was shaping up, following Rokuto's lead, bringing him one step closer to his dream school life. Nothing in the world could ruin this. After class, Kirikata, one of Asanada's crew, tipped her off about merging with another gang to become top dogs in the hood. But Asanada was knee-deep in her report as she brushed Kirikata off. He couldn't wrap his head around why she'd suddenly take an interest in school stuff and ditch her role as gang boss. Little did he know, it was all thanks to Rokuto's influence. Since it was raining, they figured they could skip out on watering the plants. But since tomorrow was report day, Asanada insisted on checking her flower bed. She apologized to Rokuto for shadowing him everywhere, admitting she had no clue what was up with her. Rokuto was floored. Asanada was actually starting to turn over a new leaf, and his spell over her was wearing thin. As she dashed off to her flower bed, she found all the flowers trashed. The guys tried to come up with excuses, but Kirikata let the cat out the back, alleging that they'd trashed the flowers in their scuffle. He'd cooked up the whole thing to shake Asanada back to her old self. Mission accomplished. Rokuto decided to check out the damage, only to find all the delinquents roughed up and Asanada standing over them like Batman after he beats up a couple minions. She'd gone back to her old ways, thanks to Kirikata's scheme. Asanada finally understood why she'd been fixated on Rokuto. She was in love. This was all new territory for her. Asanada and Kirikata met up with the Onishima Union Gang, and the two crews joined forces to become the baddest of the bad. But the Onishima crew wasn't too keen on teaming up with a pint-sized powerhouse like Asanada. That was until Asanada gave them all a serious beatdown. In the rain, Rokuto pleaded with Rana to save Asanada from the shady characters she'd allied herself with, promising she wouldn't get hurt. Meanwhile, Kirikata got the green light to join the Onishima Union gang alongside Asanada. Suddenly, Rokuto burst in to stop Asanada from making a huge mistake by launching into her plant life report. Just as the gang moved to shut him up, Rana took them all down like Jackie Chan in a kung fu movie. While Rana held her ground, Rokuto kept on with the report, shocking Asanada, who was the only one who could match Rana. While Rana was busy dealing with the other members, Kirikata socked Rokuto with a mean punch, but he kept on trucking with the report, taking hit after hit from Kirikata like a gym punching bag. Despite Rokuto being on the ropes, he didn't back down. He approached Asanada and confessed that her flowers were the most beautiful of them all, bringing her to tears. He knew deep down, Asanada was a good kid. Kirikata tried to argue otherwise, saying she was rotten to the core, but Rokuto shut him down, telling Asanada it was okay if she'd been bad before, she could start fresh, make friends, and live a decent life. 
Just as Rana finished off the last gang member, Asanada stepped in to take a hit meant for Rokuto. She admitted she wanted to stick around school and ditch the delinquent life. Rokuto out here saving souls. The rest of the Onishima Union gang showed up, dead set on dealing with the girls. But Rokuto's buddies swooped like a flock of clumsy ninjas, setting off sprinklers and slathering wax on the floor to give the group a chance to bolt. Inuma showed up too. Finally, Kirikata realized that Asanata was done with the thug life and told her to run while he held off the attackers. As they dashed back, Asanata admitted she'd let go of her feelings for Rokuto, sensing he and Rana were already an item. But she was glad she'd felt something for him. Rokuto was just glad everything worked out in the end. And they all trotted off down the happy road home that goes on forever. Days later, Rokuto finally nails his motorbike driver's license, and Inuma tosses him a snazzy gangster motorbike as a gift. At first, Rokuto's hesitant to take it, but Inuma insists it's a gesture of friendship. But trouble rolls in on two wheels in the form of Izami, a girl with a heart set on law enforcement in a fashion sense borrowed straight from a motorbike cop's wardrobe. She's got dreams of being a real deal cop once she's out of high school, but for now, she's playing dress up and giving gang members a piece of her mind. But when she spots Rokuto, she was smitten faster than a Pikachu on a thunderstone. Suddenly, her dreams of enforcing the law took a detour as she found herself tangled up in a love-struck haze, convinced that Rokuto was her knight in shining exhaust pipes. Next thing you know, Azami's popping up at Rokuto's school, scratching her head over why a prince like him would be rolling with the gangster crew. She lays down the law, telling Rokuto he's gotta ditch the flashy ride. But when Rokuto explains he needs it, she starts bawling, saying he can ride in her sidecar instead. And, well, Rokuto caves cause he can't handle seeing a girl cry. But hold on to your helmets cause Izami's got a lead foot, and she's dead set on showing Rokuto just how wild riding a motorbike can be. Rokuto's sweating bullets cause he's pretty sure she's the baddest chick in town. Once they're back home, Azami takes it slow and gets all philosophical, telling Rokuto that motorbikes are like the epitome of freedom, and thugs like him are just ruining the whole vibe. The next day, Azami rolls up to Rokuto's school, offering him a ride home, playing chauffeur like it's her day job. Only this time, there's no sidecar, and Rokuto's gotta wrap his arms around her, which sets them both blushing. Later on, some dude shows Rokuto a pic of Azami, warning him she's a total loose cannon. But Rokuto smells something fishy cause the guy's sporting an Onishima Union ring. So he plays dumb, acting like he's got no clue who Izami is. The dude says they'll talk to her if they catch her. Rokuto spills the beans to his buddies, but Colonel warns him not to get caught up in Izami's drama cause if she's into him. She's gotta be bad news, and that's not gonna jive with Rokuto's dream of a chill school life. But Inuma drops a bomb, saying the guy who warned Rokuto is AI, a quiet dude who turns into a motorbike maniac. Last year, he wrecked a motorbike cop real bad, leaving him too messed up to ride. So Azami's in some serious danger. So Rokuto figures he's gotta tip Azami off, but he's got no digits to dial. The only way to catch her attention, roll up in style on some flashy gang motorbikes. Azami spots him in a flash, and Rokuto spills the beans, telling her she's gotta ditch the motorbikes cause she's playing with fire. But Azami's got revenge on her mind for what AI did to her cop crush. Rokuto finally musters up the guts to rally his crew, saying they can't leave Azami hanging. When a gal needs help, you gotta lend a hand, right? So they're gearing up to help Azami catch AI tomorrow. Azami is. The dude says they'll talk to her if they catch her. Rokuto spills the beans to his buddies, but Colonel warns him not to get caught up in Azami's drama cause if she's into him. She's gotta be bad news, and that's not gonna jive with Rokuto's dream of a chill school life. But Inuma drops a bomb, saying the guy who warned Rokuto is AI, a quiet dude who turns into a motorbike maniac. Last year, he wrecked a motorbike cop real bad, leaving him too messed up to ride. So Azami's in some serious danger. So Rokuto figures he's gotta tip Azami off, but he's got no digits to dial. The only way to catch her attention, roll up in style on some flashy gang motorbikes. Azami spots him in a flash, and Rokuto spills the beans, telling her she's gotta ditch the motorbikes cause she's playing with fire. But Azami's got revenge on her mind for what AI did to her cop crush. Rokuto finally musters up the guts to rally his crew, saying they can't leave Azami hanging. When a gal needs help, you gotta lend a hand, right? So they're gearing up to help Azami catch AI tomorrow. The next day rolls around, and Colonel breaks the news to Rana that their motorbike cruising plans are on hold. But the truth is, Rokuto's got cold feet about putting Rana in harm's way. 
come nightfall, Azami tails AI along the road until he leads her smack into an ambush. He tries to recruit her into the Onishina Union, impressed by her skills, but she ain't having it. Lucky for her, Colonel, Chief, Inuma, and Rokuto swoop in just in time to have her back. AI just chuckles at their crew and throws down the gauntlet for a bike showdown. Meanwhile, Rana catches wind that Rokuto's in for a bike brawl, and she's fuming at the thought of him in danger. The match is about to kick off, and AI lays down the rules, catches him, and he'll do whatever they want. But Rokuto's got a ride with him. Rokuto ain't backing down, but he's gripping onto AI for dear life cause AI is pulling some crazy stunts. Rokuto's buddies keep close, but the Onishina Union's hot on their heels, too hot for comfort. Inuma pulls a wild move, sacrificing his bike to take out the baddies, while Colonel goes full throttle in pursuit of an escapee. But things got hairy when more goons showed up, and Chief was sweating bullets since Inuma was totally outnumbered. Thankfully, Rana rolls in on a bike, swinging her wooden sword and popping tires like it's nobody's business. Chief wants Rana to go save Rokuto, but Inuma is hesitant because he doesn't want to bruise Rokuto's ego, and Rokuto didn't want Rana in the line of fire. So Rana took a seat and waited, knowing that Rokuto could handle the situation. Meanwhile, Azami's hot on AI's tail, and he finally remembers her. Turns out, he used to be pals with a motorized policeman who tried to straighten him out. But when AI nearly caused an accident, the cop swooped in to save Azami, ending up in a bad wreck himself. Azami's been gunning for revenge ever since, thinking AI did it on purpose. AI tries to convince Rokuto that Azami's beyond saving. Just like him, a daredevil with a death wish. But Rokuto's dead set on proving him wrong, turning back to face Azami and asking if she's scared. She admits she's terrified, but her thirst for payback outweighs the fear. Rokuto gets it, pledging to help her nab AI. They hit a curve, and AI guns it, thinking Rokuto's bit the dust. But Azami swoops in, saving him from a fall. Rokuto manages to get a foot on AI, signaling Azami's victory. With that, the match is over, and Azami's the champ. As a prize, AI spills the beans on the whereabouts of the cop she loved. The next day, Azami and AI pay the cop a visit, finding him working as a security guard since he can't ride anymore. The cop embraces AI, telling him he finally caught him. AI breaks down, apologizing for the past. Days later, they finally hit the road for that cruising trip, and Azami's at the wheel. No Prince Charming needed, she's the princess driver. Days later, Rokuto decides to get Rana a gift as a token of gratitude for everything she does for him. While on his way to school, a bunch of bad girls try to carry his bag, but Asanata steps in, restoring order. Rana gives them a piercing look, scaring them off, and takes the bag back to Rokuto. This way, the class president observes this and feels a pang of sadness, thinking Rokuto has changed from the normal guy she once knew to someone surrounded by delinquents and a flock of girls. In the afternoon, all of Rokuto's pals and gals gather at his house for a chill hangout. When Rokuto steps out to grab some snacks, the others feel a bit awkward because Rana doesn't say much when Rokuto's not around. To break the ice, Asanata starts asking Rana questions to get to know her better, her favorite food, blood type, and such. Rana's responses are short, but they manage to learn a bit more about her. After everyone leaves, Rokuto plucks up the courage to give Rana the gift. She blushes with joy when she sees it's a hair tie. The next day, Asanata tries to befriend Rana by offering her notes so she doesn't flunk out like Asanata did. Rokuto is pleased because he wants Rana to have friends. Later, Mizue assigns them the task of cleaning the classroom and bike racks. While Rokuto's crew tackles the classroom, Asanada shows Rana how to clean the floor. They get so into it that they end up ripping up tiles to clean better. By the end, Asanada is wiped out and falls asleep on Rana's lap. In the evening, Rokuto, Colonel, and Chief hit up a restaurant. Some jerks at another table start mocking them, but Rokuto and his crew brush it off. That is until one of the girls mentions how pathetic it is that she got a hair tie from a loser. Rokuto panics because he hasn't seen Rana wearing his gift yet and worries he's got no style. Meanwhile, the girls, led by Asanada, are waiting for Inuma to join them to meet Rokuto and his crew. Tsubaki suggests Rana change her style to win Rokuto's affection. She spots the hair tie on Rana's wrist but learns Rana treasures it too much to wear it. Tsubaki, a cover model for a youth magazine, takes charge and picks out new outfits for the girls and Inuma. Later at the restaurant, the thugs try to mess with Rokuto's crew, but the gang arrives in style with new outfits, scaring the thugs away. This way watches in shock as delinquents from other schools show respect for Rokuto. They all sit down to eat, and Rokuto admires Rana's pink dress, though he's a tad sad she's not wearing his hair tie. 
but Rana reveals she wears it on her wrist so she can see it all the time. Just having it makes her happy. After the meal, Inuma speaks up, warning them that Onishima gang members, led by Doji, might seek revenge for Rokuto's previous actions. Rokuto decides to apologize, and Rana pledges her support. Despite Inuma's disagreement, they all agree to avoid a confrontation with Onishima. Meanwhile, Doji expresses his interest in Rana considering her the one who single-handedly took down Onishima Union in the past. They will start mocking them, but Rokudo and his crew brush it off. That is until one of the girls mentions how pathetic it is that she got a hair tie from a loser. Rokudo panics because he hasn't seen Rana wearing his gift yet and worries he's got no style. Meanwhile, the girls, led by Asanada, are waiting for Inuma to join them to meet Rokudo and his crew. Tsubaki suggests Rana change her style to win Rokudo's affection. She spots the hair tie on Rana's wrist but learns Rana treasures it too much to wear it. Tsubaki, a cover model for a youth magazine, takes charge and picks out new outfits for the girls and Inuma. Later at the restaurant, the thugs try to mess with Rokudo's crew, but the gang arrives in style with new outfits, scaring the thugs away. This way watches in shock as delinquents from other schools show respect for Rokudo. They all sit down to eat, and Rokuto admires Rana's pink dress, though he's a tad sad she's not wearing his hair tie. But Rana reveals she wears it on her wrist so she can see it all the time. Just having it makes her happy. After the meal, Inuma speaks up, warning them that Onishima gang members, led by Doji, might seek revenge for Rokuto's previous actions. Rokuto decides to apologize, and Rana pledges her support. Despite Inuma's disagreement, they all agree to avoid a confrontation with Onishima. Meanwhile, Doji expresses his interest in Rana, considering her the one who single-handedly took down Onishima Union in the past. Days later, an unexpected event unfolds. Doji and his generals transfer to Rokuto's school. Their names are Yu, Kuhai, Hando, Reino, and Kazino. Rokuto is prepared to apologize for any past offenses, but Doji surprises everyone by stating they transferred to be closer to Rokuto, admiring his courage and the trust he commands. Rokuto is at a loss for words, while Asanada extends a welcoming handshake, shocking the entire class with the sight of two top dogs in harmony. Rumors spread like wildfire among the school's delinquents, and Rokuto's class becomes the most feared, as many now believe he's been a secret gang leader all along. Later, the Onishima members gather on the rooftop and grumble about having to feign peace. Doji, however, insists it's necessary to learn more about Rana, though merely mentioning her sends shivers down his spine. He's still haunted by what she did to Onishima years ago. In class, the Onishima members mix in, sitting beside Rokudo's friends. During recess, Rokudo, Chief, and Colonel take refuge in the bathroom as Rokudo can't handle being under such intense scrutiny. Colonel frets that Rokudo's forehead spell might incite fights over the Onishima girls, but Chief reassures him, believing the girls can be friends like Rana, Asanada, and Tsubaki. Upon leaving the bathroom, Rana starts chasing Rokudo, leading Colonel to suspect the spell on Rokudo's forehead is now attracting troublemakers. Rokudo flees until Rana catches up and explains she's a girl who dresses as a boy, while her brother Kazino dresses as a girl. Rokudo knows the spell on his forehead prompted this revelation. Meanwhile, Doji attempts to engage Rana in conversation, but she remains stoic. He believes her emotions are trapped, but when Rokudo enters the classroom, Rana rushes excitedly to him, leading Doji to realize Rokudo is the key to unlocking Rana. Days pass, and the Onishima members integrate well into the school, even becoming heroes when they retaliate against students bullied by outsiders. As time goes on, the school festival approaches, and Rokudo's classmates suggest the yakisoba stall for simplicity. However, Rokudo believes the festival is significant and proposes a play instead. Rana backs him, and with Doji's support, the class agrees to do a play. Later, Kazino confronts Rokudo, concerned about Rana's increasingly girly appearance. Unable to reveal that he knows Kazino's secret, Rokudo dodges the question, accidentally brushing Kazino's chest and earning a punch in return. Kazino silently vows to protect his sister from Rokudo. In the afternoon, Rana and Rokudo stay behind to decide on a play for the festival. Despite Rokudo's willingness to let her choose, Rana insists on doing whatever he wants. However, he encourages her to pick any story she likes, prompting her to head to the library. Just then, Yui enters with a declaration of admiration for strong boys, her heart racing as she prepares to give Rokudo a love letter. When Rana returns with armfuls of books, Yui hastily hides the letter and exits, swearing a vendetta on Rana. The preparations for the school play continued, and as the class ran out of cardboard, Rokudo volunteered to procure more. 
However, on his way, he found himself surrounded by a female gang, who quickly developed an admiration for him. They were known as Team Ryugu, led by Ottoheim, who offered apologies for her girl's behavior. They clarified that they hailed from another city and had no intention of causing trouble. Rather, they wished to participate in various school festivals. Unexpectedly, Rana arrived due to Rokuto's delay, and he was surprised when Ottoheim embraced her. It emerged that Rana had been a member of Team Ryugu two years prior. Her presence had made them nearly invincible until a confrontation with Onishima occurred in her absence, leading Ottoheim to disband the group to rebuild it as friends. However, Rana's subsequent solo defeat of Onishima caused her to depart without explanation. After hearing this account, the Ryugu girls were invited to attend the school play at the festival. Upon returning to school, preparations for the play resumed. That evening, only the boys remained to paint cardboard, some removing their shirts. However, Rokuto declined, mindful of Rana's presence, who thanked him with a heart-shaped gesture. The following day, during dialogue practice in the gym, Kohei presented Doji with a photo, enraging him and prompting the Onishima Six to retreat to the roof. Doji revealed the photo, depicting Rana, Rokuto, and Ottoheim, and warned that time was running short as they needed to seize Rana. Days later, a schoolboy was assaulted, and Doji accused the girls from Team Ryugu. As everyone revered Onishima, the students were ready to deal with Team Ryugu. Rokuto intervened, asserting that the Ryugu girls had changed for the better. However, Kazino entered the classroom with the battered Reino, claiming she had been attacked by Team Ryugu. This incited the students' anger, leaving Rokuto at a loss for words, while Doji urged him to seek revenge but Rokuto refused the request. The following day, rumors circulated that Team Ryugu would raid the school, casting Rokuto as a traitor. Fortunately, Inuma sided with him, advocating for an investigation to discern the truth. They soon discovered a common link between Ryugu and Onishima, Rana. Meanwhile, Colonel and Chief harbored suspicions, leading them to conduct their own inquiry. Elsewhere, Doji confronted Rana proposing a solution to Rokuto's social isolation. Incensed, she cornered him with her wooden sword, only to relent upon realizing his point. Subsequently, Rokuto and Inuma searched for Rana, but learned from Doji that she had aligned with Onishima, who planned to confront Team Ryugu the following day. Doji informed Rokuto that while he dwelled in the realm of daylight, he and Rana existed in the underworld. Should he wish to reclaim Rana, he must venture into the realm of the underworld which is still just the underworld. Feeling perplexed, Rokuto found himself at a loss for what to do, but Inuma swooped in with a timely reminder that he wasn't flying solo in this wild ride called life. Later, when they rendezvoused with their pals and gals, Colonel and Chief had an amusing tale to share. They had been tailing two troublemakers who purported to be part of Team Ryugu, only to discover that the miscreants in question were none other than Reino and Kazino themselves. The Tangled Web of High School Drama Rokuto proposed that the safest course of action would be to prevent Team Ryugu from infiltrating the school the next day. After all, Rana would never forgive herself if any harm befell her friend Otohimi. It was a tricky situation, but Rokuto was determined to navigate it with finesse. The following day, Doji convened with his generals and Rana, outlining his plan to resolve everything. He asserted that today would mark the conclusion of their ordeal, they would confront Team Ryugu, and Rana would confront Otohimi. According to Doji's scheme, once all was said and done, everyone would drop out of school, allowing Rokuto to finally enjoy the peaceful school life he desired. Rana readily agreed to the plan but issued a stern warning, anyone who dared to harm Rokuto would face her wrath. Meanwhile, Rokuto and his cohorts split into teams, strategizing to intercept the Ryugu girls before they could reach the school coordinating their efforts through transmitters. Colonel and Rokuto stationed themselves at their designated spot when Reino unexpectedly appeared. She claimed to have severed ties with Onishima, although Colonel remained skeptical. However, Reino confided in him, revealing her true identity as a girl. Encouraged by her candor, Colonel decided to place his trust in Reino, believing that together they could emerge victorious. But their moment of trust was shattered when Colonel spotted the Ryugu girls passing under the bridge. Before he could react, Reino, or rather Amano, the eldest of the triplets, attacked him, revealing that the real Reino had been imprisoned and accused of betraying Onishima. After Amano knocked out Rokuto, he woke up to the concerned faces of his friends. Groaning, he informed them that the Ryugu girls had already made it past the bridge. To their dismay, they realized that Team Ryugu had infiltrated the school on motorbikes and were now being escorted to the gymnasium. But wait, plot twist, it wasn't actually Team Ryugu, it was Azami and her biker gang, inherited from none other than Aoi. To pull off this epic switcheroo, 
All the guys had to don women's clothing to pose as the Ryugu girls. Talk about a cross-dressing caper. Little did they know, this ingenious scheme was cooked up by Colonel, just in case their initial plan to intercept Team Ryugu failed. Meanwhile, as the real Team Ryugu entered the school, Tsubaki sounded the alarm, urging everyone to evacuate pronto. But alas, it was too late. Students loyal to Onishima blocked their escape routes, setting the stage for a showdown. Amidst the chaos, Otohimi bravely squared off against Yu, urging her girls to flee. Most heeded her call, but one remained behind, only to fall prey to Hando's menacing grip. With a threat to break her arm, Otohimi reluctantly surrendered, agreeing to comply with Onishima's demands. Just as tensions reached a boiling point, Rokudo and his crew stormed onto the scene. Tsubaki quickly briefed them on the situation, but before they could formulate a plan, Doji's voice crackled through a transmitter they had nabbed from Tsubaki. Talk about timing. Rokudo confronted Doji, questioning his intentions and leaving Rana astray. With a smirk, Doji brushed it off, claiming Rana was already a rebel at heart. He even dared to suggest that Rokudo could only find happiness by letting go of Rana. But Rokudo wasn't having any of it. He declared that he alone had the power to make Rana happy, and his words were met with applause from his friends. Even Doji seemed taken aback by this unexpected love confession. Doji, however, wasn't about to let Rokudo off easy. He challenged him to a showdown on the rooftop, knowing full well it wouldn't be a cakewalk. To reach the rooftop, they had to navigate through a gauntlet of schoolyard thugs and troublemakers. Inuma's advice, just punch your way through, easier said than done. Their feeble attempts were quickly thwarted, leaving them stranded at the first hurdle. Enter Izami, riding in on her trusty motorbike. But even she couldn't bulldoze past Hando, the hulking obstacle in their path. With brute strength, Hando halted Izami's bike in its tracks, threatening to derail their plans. Just when things seemed dire, Asanada stepped up to the plate. She saw through Hando's tough exterior, recognizing him as a softie who helped kids cross the street and hit the books hard. But her words fell on deaf ears as Hando silenced her with a punch. For Hando, obedience to Doji was his ticket to respect and fear. But Asanata warned him of the perils of blind obedience, drawing from her own experiences. Undeterred, Hando saw only strength as his currency, igniting a battle of wills. Neither of them pulled any punches, and the blows landed hard. But in the end, it was Asanata who proved her mettle, knocking Hando out cold with a gut-wrenching punch. Hando, stripped of his strength, felt like a shell of himself. But Asanata offered reassurance, reminding him of his other talents and pledging her support. At that moment, Hando realized who the real boss was. Meanwhile, on the rooftop, Rana arrived as Doji ordered her to take down Otohimi, claiming it was the key to Rokudo's peaceful school life. Downstairs, Rokudo and his crew faced off against Kuhai, halting their progress. Inuma, facing Kuhai, opted to settle old scores, knowing it would be an uphill battle. Memories flooded back as he recalled the betrayal of his former friends, who sided with Kuhai, leaving him defeated. It was only Tsubaki who remained loyal, marking the beginning of their bond. Chief's defiance jolted Inuma back to the present, reigniting his fighting spirit. With a broken finger as a testament to their solidarity, Inuma rallied, ready to stand by his friend's side. As the brawl raged on, Inuma urged Rokudo, Colonel, and Chief to press forward. Despite Kuhai's strength, Inuma fought with newfound resolve, drawing strength from his companions. Defeating Kuhai was just the beginning, as Amano and Kazino loomed ahead. But with trust in his friends, Inuma left it for them to handle, and gave himself a well-deserved break. Amano wasted no time, hitting Colonel and Chief with the fire extinguisher, accusing Rokudo of meddling with Reino's idea of school life. Rokudo was furious, after all, big brothers are supposed to be Superman for their little sisters, not let them join gangs. But before he could retaliate, Kazino grabbed him, while Amano closed in on Colonel and Chief. Then came the surprise, Kazino kissed Rokudo on the cheek, revealing herself as Reino. She explained that she and Kazino swapped places to break free from Amano's influence and pursue their own paths. With Reino heading to the roof to face Amano, Rokudo was momentarily freed. Reino expressed her desire for a normal school life, away from her brother's shadow. Amano, however, saw it as a challenge, unleashing his fighting prowess. Despite Amano's training, Reino held her ground, showcasing her own skills. Amano realized his grip on his siblings was slipping, but Reino reassured him that even though they might diverge, they'd always be the triplets. Meanwhile, Rokudo faced Yu, who saw him as a towering figure thanks to his spell. Her romantic fantasies turned into a fiery ordeal as she whipped and hugged him, only to recoil when his strength became too real. 
trying to scare her off backfired, leaving Rokudo trapped in her affections. A daring rescue turned Yu's infatuation into full-blown love, rendering her unconscious with passion. Seizing the moment, Rokudo made his way to the roof, where Rana and Otohimi's showdown was in full swing. Interrupting the fight, Rokudo urged Rana to stop, standing between her and Otohimi. Concern etched on her face, Rana returned his hair tie, signaling the end of their journey together, and told him goodbye. She was gonna beat it faster than Michael Jackson. Rana delivered a heartbreaking truth, their differences meant they could not be together. Some Finn and Flame Princess lore, the only difference this time is that only one of them is hot. While Rokudo cherished their bond, she never considered Otohin a friend. Despite her penchant for violence, Rokudo found her sadness perplexing. Confessing her conflicted emotions, Rana admitted her inexplicable attraction to Rokudo, leaving him in tears. Desperate to stay by her side, Rokudo vowed to become stronger. Yet, Rana insisted he embrace his school life, refusing to drag him into her world. Undeterred, Rokudo challenged Doji to a showdown, determined to defy fate. As fists flew, Rokudo landed blows, driven by his love for Rana. However, Doji entered Ultra Instinct and his ruthless tactics threatened to shatter Rokudo's resolve. Luckily, reinforcements, Reino, Colonel, and Chief halted the brawl, standing united against Doji's tyranny. Colonel rallied their allies, emphasizing Rokudo's unwavering support in their times of need. With renewed determination, they confronted Doji, each strike fueled by Rokudo's unwavering spirit. Despite his bravado, Doji faltered, facing a united front for the first time. Rana's unexpected intervention further disarmed Doji, who mistook her actions as defense. Instead, Rana affirmed Rokudo's belief in her hidden kindness. Moved by his unwavering faith, she pledged her allegiance to him, sealing their bond with a blush. Defeated and disgraced, Doji retreated, his once loyal followers choosing friendship over his misguided ideals. Reino and Kazino pursued their dreams elsewhere, while Yu vanished without a trace. In the aftermath, Rokudo savored the tranquility he had long sought. With his friends by his side, they triumphantly presented their play at the school festival, despite the inevitable mishaps. Rokudo accepted that encounters with trouble were inevitable, but with his steadfast companions, he was ready to face whatever came their way, united in their pursuit of lifelong dreams. And that's a wrap on Taosuki Rokudo's wild adventure at Amori High. From a bullet nobody to the unexpected heartthrob of the delinquent scene to even facing off against badass biker gangs, Rokudu's journey was nothing short of chaotic. But hey, with his trusty Infinite Riz spell, he turned the Uno reverse card on his tormentors and effortlessly cultivated himself a harem of bad girls, who knew what the power of Infinite Riz could accomplish. Thanks for watching, and be sure to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell for more wild tales and unexpected adventures, and Riz. Until next time, stay awesome.